Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Am Johal. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, delighted that so many of you could join us on a sunny evening uh, for the talk tonight, The Human Right to Housing and the Vancouver Situation. Uh, we're very lucky to have Maloon Katari, the former UN Special Repertoire on Housing, uh, back uh, to uh, Vancouver. I'm just going to give you uh, a little bit of background on the, uh, the format uh, for tonight before I introduce other people, but just wanted to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, uh, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, Maloon will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and we have four panelists who will respond for about five minutes each. And we'll get into a little bit of a 10 or 15 minute conversation and we'll open it up for a conversation for the rest uh, of the evening. Uh, but before we begin, I just ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Audrey Siegel from the Musqueam Nation. Um, first, I just really wanna say thank you to each of you for making time to be here. We all know how busy life can get, and even though we try to simplify it, <laughs> it's not always so easy. So it makes a big difference that you make the time to be here to, I call it cross-pollination with, with Mylun coming and sharing the knowledge and experience that he's gathered. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, and being part of what's gonna happen tonight, and I hope you guys are too. So, Mitsep Kurkwilum Atanash Matguimoth Tamoch Tana Whale, Ike Gwanish Gwalo and Squinzi Kutznala, Schlem Tana Kunasquich, Tanitzint, Humathguim, Tama Hwai Huikden, Itzelina August, Kunasit Lash. These are the words of my ancestors, the words that this land and my people have known and used for over 10,000 years. Um, our knowledge goes back to the first sunrise. So to be able to speak it today is, is a testimony to the strength of the people that we come from and the importance of the societies that existed in order for us to carry on the work that we're doing today. For me, everything is connected, like each little dots. It's like the uh, pictures of energy and the little, uh, I picture it like tendrils shooting out, connecting it all and transferring information and energy. and. Um, I wish it were simpler. <laughs> but the translation is welcome to the unceded lands of the Musqueam people. My name is Schlem Tanat. I also, I'm from Musqueam. I am the granddaughter of the late Stephen and Selena August, and it gives me feelings of great joy to be here with you today. I'm really honored to be invited, and uh, not just to do the welcome, but to be on the panel, and I'm really excited for the people I'll be sitting with, and most importantly, to hear your feedback. And as I said, to, to let that cross-pollination happen in, in a really good and effective way so that we all move forward nuts and nuts as one. So I'm going to finish here. Oh, I'm going to ask you guys to clap. I'm just going to do one verse of a song because our ways are finished with the song to do the welcome, and I am welcoming you. So um, if you want to clap, I'm going to do one verse of the Coast Salish Anthem, a song that was uh, um, that Chief Dan George gave to all to sing. And when I sing this song, I see and I feel his love for this land. Sometimes it makes me giddy and sometimes it makes me feel really solemn and serene, but I, I hope that you feel it the same way. So I'm just gonna do one verse so we can keep this going, but make sure that we're also doing it correctly. So if you wanna clap with me, then you're my drum today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, he Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Audrey. 
Uh, it's a great pleasure to be introducing uh, Maloon Katari. He visited uh, Vancouver uh, 10 years ago as part of a UN mission uh, to Canada where he visited Montreal, Ottawa, a number of other cities, Lubicon Territory in Alberta. And he came to Vancouver at the time of the Vancouver, the lead up to the Vancouver 2010 uh, Olympics. It was a very charged issue. He did a number of press conferences. Uh, he visited uh, a tent city squat uh, at that time, and just today uh, he visited the Balmoral Hotel and also the same site of that tent city uh, as well. Uh, he's actually uh, here to uh, receive an honorary doctorate from SFU uh, on Wednesday, but he's an architect and internationally recognized human rights advocate. His work has led to the establishment of new global tools and standards for addressing housing and land rights. His work has also influenced housing rights law and policy making worldwide. From 2000 to 2008, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing for the Human Rights uh, Council, uh, he led many country missions uh, over that period of time. And since 2015, he's the president of, the UP, of UPR Info. He was a convener of the Working Group on Human Rights in India, uh, and the UN from 2009 to 2014, an Indian human rights coalition that notably focuses on the Universal Periodic Review. He's also a visiting scholar for two years at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Maloon Katari. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks very much, Anne, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, let me begin by um, acknowledging with uh, deep humility and respect uh, that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Um, as Anne mentioned, I was here, um, well, this is actually my fifth visit uh, to Vancouver in the last 15 years, um, and uh, every time I come back, uh, I feel at home. Um, I wish that um, the situation was better, um, and uh, I hope that you know we can all uh, work together to change uh, the situation in in, in Vancouver. Um, and I really appreciate the the spirit and the collective uh, energy that is there in this city. And I think uh, we need to draw upon that uh, to uh, face the what seem to be almost insurmountable challenges to the housing crisis uh, in the city. Uh, and in the province. Um, so I was here on mission in uh, 2007, um, and uh, so it's 10 years ago. Uh, in my uh, mission report, um, I looked at the issues of uh, homelessness, uh, affordability, uh, the issue of public housing, shortage, uh, discrimination in access to housing, um, the, the exploitation of uh, the lands of the First Nations, um, the issue of violence uh, against indigenous women, um, and a number of other number of other issues. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the report, um, I just I just want to um, quickly summarize the the recommendations. Um, I noticed at that time already that uh, Canada is, was one of the few countries in the world that did not have a national housing strategy. Um, I, I understand there's one being developed now, uh, and we have to see what, uh, you know, what is the basis of that and whether it's a rights, human rights-based uh, strategy. Um, I also um, called for much more coordination between the three levels of government um, uh, for a, a comprehensive and coordinated uh, national housing policy uh, for national much more uh, budgetary allocation for national home, uh, homelessness programs, long-term funding for a housing strategy. Um, I, I found it was very odd that there was no definition, and I think this continues to be the case, uh, no adequate definition on what affordable means, what is affordability uh, in, in housing. Um, and, and I called for uh, the need to actually redefine what core housing need uh, is. Um, and uh, I noticed also that uh, there was a significant shift uh, to a market-based approach to solve the housing crisis. So I actually called for a 
completely radical, different approach where there would be a national strategy to build um, a large-scale building of social housing um, and, and much better tenant, uh, tenant protection laws, um, coordinated strategy on reduction of homelessness, uh, sufficient income and housing assistance, and I'll, I'll come back to um, you know what what I understand the situation is is right now. Um, so those of you who are interested, the the the, the report is there. Um, I understand as a, as a result of the report, uh, some of the uh, federal housing programs were continued uh, for a short period. Uh, I don't have the overall national situation right now, but um, I um, I want to start also by. Um, uh, sort of reflecting on, so I, I've spent the last, uh, especially today, visiting uh, the downtown um, east side, uh, visiting the Balmoral Hotel, uh, the tent city, um, walking around in that neighborhood to see the, the devastating impact of uh, gentrification. And um, I, I, I think that it would be appropriate for me to say that I'm shocked by what I'm seeing 10 years later. Um, I'm shocked by the hyper speculation in the city, um, shocked by the type of measures that are being taken, such as this tax on foreign buyers. Uh, I find that very discriminatory. There should be a tax on everyone. Um, the fact that welfare rates haven't changed at all in the last 10 years, that's to me unbelievable in, in such a wealthy country and with many provinces that are actually showing a surplus uh, in their budgets. And of course, the situation in the downtown east side with the significant reduction of the SROs, um, a complete lack of accountability of uh, the slum landlords like the uh, Sohato family. But I mean, I would like to focus much more on the accountability of the, of the city uh, for letting the situation get to the stage that it has. Uh, I don't understand that. Perhaps some of you can respond. Why, why is it that a city would let um, SROs get to a situation where there's, they become life and health threatening uh, situations which, you know, um, should not be allowed at all. Um, and of course, it's uh, uh, Vancouver being the third most expensive city in the world uh, and Canada being one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It, it's really uh, shocking to me every time I come here that there are such levels of poverty coexisting with multi-million dollar um, uh, condominiums and houses, um, and and the the, the types of um, uh, solutions that are being proposed, uh, you know, this Woodward condominium, for example, I don't think that's a good example at all because it just continues the kind of discriminatory, segregated um, sort of policy with separate entrances for the higher and lower income people, um, and and it sort of pushes, as we have seen, all of you are very well aware. Uh, it just accelerates gentrification in the area. So in the time that I have, what, what I thought I would do is um, uh, share with you some uh, positive developments from around, from around the world. Um, the situation doesn't have to be like this. Um, there is no reason. We don't need new, uh, we don't need to invent new solutions. Uh, we don't need to come up with something that no one has discovered before. Uh, cities around the world, uh, both in the north and south, have been facing uh, issues of homelessness, of uh, affordability, of uh, segregated populations. Uh, and there are many, many examples of how uh, cities are coping with the situation. Um, so I'm just going to run you through some of those, uh, and I'm hoping in the discussion we can also discuss uh, whether such solutions could be um, directly applied to Vancouver or whether they would have to be adapted to the local conditions. Um, so one very good example is the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil where there's a, there's a city policy to um, tax, to, get, to have higher taxes for more expensive housing and more expensive areas and then to use the revenue from that to actually improve um, civic services in, in uh, in what they call zones of social interest, which are sort of lower income settlements. Um, in Singapore, you have a very, very rigorous uh, mixed use housing policy where actually it's not like Woodward's at all. It's, it's more that I think 60% of the housing, both rental and ownership, um, 
you have people of different income levels living on the same floor, um, and and that has actually worked out worked out quite well. We also have solutions where cities around the world have stressed rental housing to say that okay, sixty percent, seventy percent of our housing stock is going to remain rental. We are not going to convert it into condominiums or um, ownership housing. There's Vienna, there's many cities in Switzerland, in Sweden, uh, and that's accompanied by rent control, uh, where you have, you know, you don't have a situation like you have here, where um, where the rent increases are are not tied to the tenant but to the unit, which creates a huge problem of of incremental um, displacement. Uh, and, and of course, many of these cities have um, social housing, um, which is not sort of separate. It's within all the neighborhoods. Um, those of you who are familiar with Vienna, you may have seen the exhibit at the Vancouver Museum uh, or with Geneva or, or a number of other cities in, in um, Netherlands, for example. Um, you cannot actually distinguish a building, whether it's social housing or condominiums. I mean, it, it's the quality, it's the, it's the, the manner in which it's managed, um, and the manner in which it is accepted uh, by everyone. I think that's a... Uh, on, on homelessness, there are many, many good examples. Um, the city of Bogota has a public policy on homelessness where they're actively tackling not only the question of the lack of shelters, uh, but actually getting to the roots of homelessness, which is something I haven't heard about much here. I mean, why is it that there's this 30% increase in homelessness between, what, 2014 and 2017. That's quite um, uh, disturbing. Um, in New Delhi, the city where I live, um, we have had a rigorous program of the city government and mandated by the High Court and the Supreme Court of India um, uh, developing over 200 shelters, uh, which are 24 hours. They're separate shelters for women, separate shelters for women with children. Um, and, and there is a no eviction policy, uh, no displacement. Um, and that's actually also there. Uh, this no eviction rule is there in the city of Barcelona. I don't know if many of you have followed the remarkable example of Barcelona, where um, the mayor, um, Ada Kalu, has actually come up uh, from the grassroots. She was a civil society, anti-eviction, um, anti-poverty activist. Um, similarly, the mayor of, uh, the, the chief minister, like governor of New Delhi, uh, came up uh, from the, um, you know, f from being a civil, civil rights activist. Um, in the city of Seoul, in, in uh, South Korea, you have a no eviction rule. Uh, and then there are a number of cities around the world, and I, I actually never understood why Vancouver uh, does not have this, which have declared themselves to be human rights cities. I mean, we don't have to go very far in the city. In Canada itself, Montreal has a city, Montreal Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, um, which includes a complaint mechanism where if someone has a complaint on, you know, whether it's rental issues, uh, mortgage issues, lack of civic services issues, they can go to an ombudsperson. So, um, and the, the Ontario Human Rights Commission also has that um, across Ontario. Um, the city of Madrid has just a few weeks ago released a remarkable uh, strategic plan for human rights where they want to convert the entire city of Madrid into a city which sort of scrupulously follows the right to the city um, concept and idea that everything the city has belongs to everyone who lives and works in the city, regardless of income levels or um, race or whatever. Um, so there are now about 40 or 45 cities across the world that are working on, on human rights, um, becoming human rights cities. Um, even in the United States, you have the city of San Francisco, which has on its own taken a pledge that they will implement the UN Convention on the Elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, CEDAW Convention. Um, and, and the point I want to also make is that a lot of these successes are not, um, they don't, you know, the origin is not necessarily theory or academics or it, a lot of it is based on civil society work, campaigning, movements, um, national, provincial, um, city level, very active alliances of civil society groups working across different sectors. Um, 
We see that in Mexico, we see it in Brazil, uh, we see it in India. Um, and and uh, so, so I would like to sort of stress that and uh, say that it, it's really, really important for people to come together and mobilize and protest and resist. And, and that often leads to um, changes in government. And in fact, as I mentioned, the, the situation, cases of Barcelona and New Delhi, of even new leadership, whether in the government or in the political, the different political levels that comes from, uh, from civil society. Uh, you also have, and I think Canada actually has this, but it hasn't really been implemented that well, is something called the housing continuum idea, which is completely missing here in Vancouver, that there should be a gradation of options uh, of housing. Uh, you should have emergency shelters, you should have shelters, you should have hostels, there should be cooperative housing, there should be rental housing, different forms of rental housing, and, uh, and only at the end um, there should be ownership housing. Uh, and, and you know that kind of a model sort of takes away from this obsession with ownership housing uh, that we see, which has very, very um, distorting um, results. And I think you, you've already seen here, we've had many experiences around the world in Spain um, in, the, in, the, in the 2000 period in, in Ireland where uh, the kind of hyper speculation that you see here led to actually national economic crisis. Uh, and already we see here uh, in, in Canada that the International Monetary Fund has pointed out the unsustainability of the debts and have, there is a downgrading of the banks. So it's not something that can be sustained and it has, uh, it has very, very severe um, social, uh, social uh, consequences. Um, so I, I thought that, and, and of course in terms of um, uh, this whole idea of housing being a human right, the social function of housing, moving away from seeing housing as a commodity and something that you just buy and sell, is, is, um, is taking off in, in a number of areas. In Catalonia, for example, in Spain, there's a, a progressive law that expi explicitly affirms uh, the social function of housing and, and, uh, and, and, and temporary appropriation of uh, expropriation of vacant housing. Um, a number of uh, countries, Austria, China, Philippines, have instituted restrictions on uh, on foreign purchases of residential real estate. That's happening here as well, but it's controversial, and I, I don't think that's the best solution. But, um, but that is an attempt that is that is being made. Um, uh, there is there there are a number of places where so Singapore for example has a 18 percent uh, property sales tax and an additional buyer stamp duty on wealthy property owners and investors and the revenues are used to subsidize um, low income low income individuals uh, and and you know even in the south there are many good examples the government of Algeria for example has finances the development of rental housing for households earning less than 1.5 times the minimum wage um, and on free government land. Uh, I, can, I can give you many more examples, but I thought I would sort of uh, leave it at that and uh, I look forward very much to the comments from uh, the esteemed panelists and uh, to further discussions. Thank you very much. Ask the uh, panelists to come and join us up here if they could. And as they uh, make their way up, I just want to uh, recognize uh, Melanie Mark, the newly re-elected MLA for Vancouver Mount Pleasant, uh, who is here. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, also, Maloon will be speaking tomorrow at the Museum of Vancouver, where the Vienna exhibit is on. And Sabina Bitter, who's involved uh, with that project, uh, is here. And also Suresh Rao, who uh, through the Indian Summer Festival, which is coming up next month, uh, uh, Maloon has, uh, has uh, spoken here uh, before at it. Um, so joining us uh, here, uh, directly to my left right here, Matt Hearn. He's the author of What a City is For, Remaking the Politics of Displacement, a book that came out in 2016 with MIT Press. Matt teaches uh, in urban studies at SFU and also with the School of Regional Planning uh, at UBC. He also was one of the founders of the Car Free Festival on Commercial Drive uh, as well. 
Uh, Audrey Siegel, you have just met. She's an environmental and social justice activist. Um, and uh, Jean Swanson, she's been a longtime uh, activist uh, since the early 70s with the Carnegie Community Action Project. And Margot Young is a professor of law at UBC and has worked on the Housing Justice uh, Research Project. Uh, maybe I'll start on the uh, end with you, Margot, oh. to uh, begin, just to, to respond. People are going to respond for about five minutes each. We're going to get into a bit of a conversation, and we'll open it up to everyone else. Okay. Well, I just have a, do you want me to take a, take a, yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Um, well, I have just a few general points, I suppose, to make as kind of um, supplement to what you said, Maloon, but thank you very much for your remarks, and Am, thank you for organizing this panel, and to SFU Woodwards for hosting it. Um, I wanted to start off by reminding us all that affordability is a ratio between income and housing costs, and so Vancouver currently ranks, according to one index, as the third most unaffordable city in the world amongst the sort of select cities looked at, but a piece that makes Vancouver unaffordable, very importantly, is the income side of the ratio. And so when we think about housing and about the housing crisis, it's really important also to think about the incredible uh, extent of income inequality that we have in Canada. So we know that inequality, wealth and income inequality in Canada has grown along with other nations in this era of neoliberalism, we've had a particularly accelerated rate in our country. And one important piece of this is that we have tremendous income inequality. And so until we get a government at the provincial level that's willing to make welfare rates uh, live honorable, a government that also provides for things like child care and other kinds of income supports, a government that puts in place a decent minimum wage in which people can live not in poverty when they're earning that, we're going to have a kind of housing crisis because um, the, the income needed to live in housing in this era has to be better for those at the bottom of the income scale than it currently is, and that's a clear piece of government policy that needs to happen, and it's directly connected to the housing crisis as well. So the picture is a, a complicated one, and there's no single policy that addresses it, but indeed a number of policies that some of which, importantly, lie at the provincial level, but also at, at the federal level. The other point I want to make really pertains to the federal government's involvement in the crisis. So it is true that we're one of the we're the only G7 or G8. It depends how you're counting the states that doesn't have a national housing strategy. But it's not the case that we don't have a national housing system. We have a collection of policies and laws that, in fact, guarantees the current housing crisis that we have in Canada, and moreover, that guarantees that housing inequality reflects and exacerbates income inequality. So David Helchansky, who's a housing researcher at the University of Toronto, has said uh, very cogently, or pointed out very cogently, how housing is a source of wealth aggregation, and people who have more money make even more money through the housing market, and that the current construction and configuration of housing markets in cities like Vancouver and Toronto is a mechanism for the rich to get rich, richer, and that's permitted by a series of policies, important bits of which are at the federal level, that uh, not only favor home ownership over uh, rental tenancy, but that also permit this kind of amplification of income inequality at the top end now to happen through our housing system. And uh, I think that's my time. Yeah, well, I would like to acknowledge the Coast Salish territories and thank the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish for allowing us to be here. And I also really want to thank Maloon. He could have been out whale watching or something, and he was out <laughs> hanging out with us, homeless people and Balmoral tenants and tent city residents and really giving our side a boost. So thank you so much, Maloon. Um, I really agree with what you said, that it's not something to the effect that we don't have to do anything particularly fancy in order to end homelessness. I remember working in, this, in the downtown east side in the 70s and 40 years ago, and we hardly had much, we didn't have much homelessness then. I, I think maybe about a tenth or less compared to what we have now. Because in those days we had welfare that was high enough to pay rent. Governments were building thousands of units of social housing 
every year, and we had a vacancy rate in the SROs, so people could always go in there and they were cheap. But since then, we've had uh, 40 years of austerity. My start in activism began with the start of austerity, combined with 40 years of trying to turn everything over to the market. Making everything respond to the market is so bad <clears throat> that co-op housing developments now have clauses in their operating agreements that some rents have to be at 90% of market. And the Residential Tenancy Act allows landlords to raise rents simply because the other rents in the area are comparable. And my partner, Sandy Cameron, used to always say, the market is private power. <laughs> anyway, as a result of this emphasis on the market and austerity, we have a huge uh, housing crisis. And let's be clear, it's a crisis for low-income people. It's a, quite an inconvenience for middle-income people. And as Margot just said, it's basically a gold mine for people who already own homes. And the city, Maloon, will tell you that it has a continuum of housing, and all of the reports have this continuum d diagram. But the problem is that the only housing that's being built is the housing that's on the rich end of the continuum. <laughs> anyway, so the people who run our governments know that it's Cheaper to house homeless people than keep them on the streets. There have been a lot of studies that show that. They must also know that it's not fun being homeless. Where are you going to pee? Where are you going to poo? How can you keep your stuff from being stolen by bylaw officers or other people? You get cold and soaking wet or really hot if it's summer. You're being chased away from wherever you stay. You have to pack everything around with you all day. You die at half the rate of other British Columbians. Politicians know this. And so now we've got 2,138 counted homeless people in Vancouver, more than ever, which could be increased by 150 Balmoral Hotel residents. And the city and the province are talking about mats in a community center for some of the most vulnerable people in the city. People who need housing more than a homeowner needs the homeowner grant. People who need housing more than someone in the, in the top 1% needs the $41,000 tax reduction per year that they've reaped thanks to this Liberal government since, 2000, since the year 2000. And where is the city? They're afraid they might lose some money in court. They're more afraid of losing some money in court than of having people suffer and maybe die on the street. I'm talking about the Balmoral. They're trying to shift the blame for doing nothing onto the landlord, who is awful. But the city does have section 23.8, which allows them to do the repairs and bill the owner. And where is the province? We basically have no provincial government right now. And there was hardly any mention of homelessness during the provincial election. And the Balmoral residents. A couple of days ago, we were up occupying City Hall trying to get some answers, and they were reading statements that they'd read. Uh, they were telling Jeff Meggs, a, a woman who lives there named Nikki, she, this is a quote, we are humans and deserve respect. It's to time to see this for what it is, a hate crime against the people of the Balmoral. We want to be treated with respect, not thrown out like garbage. Another woman named Faye said we're not a disposable population. We deserve dignity and to be respected like other citizens. They said this would not happen at the Olympic Village. It seems to me like Nikki and Faye are right, that hate is about more than speech and thoughts. It's about action and inaction. And that's what we're seeing now with the Balmoral, with the 10 cities, with the ever-growing homelessness that's so preventable. So I don't know, 40 years of this is getting rather old. But some of us are going to just keep jammering at the politicians and organizing. We don't accept the world with homelessness. Stop the hate against the people who live at the Balmoral and in the tent cities and on the street. Build some housing they can afford and raise welfare rates and buy some hotels so people will now will be safe for the winter. The priority for housing has to be the people who need it the most, the ones who have none. Um, so I hope you can join us in fighting for this stuff. And I want to thank Maloon again for hanging out with us today. Yeah, when he could have been doing stuff that was probably a lot more fun. I 
too would like to say thank you for traveling and for, for bringing your knowledge and um, your ancestors to each of you for being here, for organizing, for, for the space. Um, and as I say, there's no point in us to be here if you're not here. So I really thank you. And Melanie, I, I, I have, it's no surprise how I feel about government, but when I speak of representation on all levels, you're the only one I see that actually represents me. And I love you for that, and I thank you for that. It really makes me feel um, hopeful and powerful to see you do what you do. So, you know, from my heart and my ancestors to yours, I really thank you for doing that. This is a really emotional, well, everything's emotional for me, I shouldn't say. <laughs> but this is a particularly emotional topic. Um, as Jean says, I mean, I, I have so much respect for Jean. I have so much love for Jean. I have, like, it's just, it's just, I, and I think everyone here knows this feeling. Um, I don't want to drag you to a bad place, but for a second I'm going to. The feeling of knowing that, for me right now, where, where we sit, my ancestors have been displaced for at least for 200 years. They were, they were decimated off of this land so Vancouver can exist, so city hall and churches could set up. But our long houses, and our sacred sites were destroyed. And now when I go to City Hall, they'll lock the doors and say, sorry, you can't come in. How does that, how does that work? Why is that all right with the mass majority of the people who will say, yeah, but we need these laws and we need order. These laws and this order don't work for me. They never have and they never will. And you know why? Because they were set up to not work for me. They were set up to work against me. And now they're set up to work against you because you're not willing to be good little sheeple and follow the status quo. Which means the developer-driven market must be allowed to continue so that the haves, for lack of a better uh, phrase, haves can continue to have. That at the expense of countless untold numbers of lives, we know that Canada and the United States, States exist on at least 100 million First Nations deaths murders. What's that number break down for Vancouver? I don't know. I've never really done the math. I just know that my people are still in this land, and that means I have a duty and an obligation to stand with, especially our most vulnerable. Right now, the big topic is the Balmoral. A couple summers ago, it was Oppenheimer Tent City. And boy, did I get a pretty swift lesson on how this government works at Tent City, going and sitting at meetings for months on end, and all they were doing was just nothing. Nothing, a lot of talking, and that's what we still see happening up in City Hall when we had to go occupy. And why do we have to occupy our own City Hall, by the way? And why do they think that they can lock us out when we go in peacefully with only the intention of providing and caring for our most vulnerable? And this brings me to where I really come from. I come from a longhouse. I come from people who lived in longhouses since the first sunrise. When we speak of housing and social housing, how can I not talk about longhouses? Um, which again would drive home the point of why don't we have them? I ask and I'm told, well, you, you First Nations, you three nations have to work that out amongst yourselves. We're not willing to, we're, you guys have to work that out. Hmm, fine, okay. But they can sell the big church right across on... Um, Berard uh, over by VGH. That church is allowed to sell that land and in the time of unceded lands. Is any of that money coming to the three nations? Were they consulted at all? These are all related issues. Um, in the longhouses, we, you spoke of um, ownership, ownership obsession. We didn't have ownership obsession. We had, if there was anything, it was communal ownership. You had six to eight families who lived in a long house. And again, um, another theme, all levels of society, all levels of our society. We had everything from the noble class to slave class, all living in the same houses. Each person's role, each family's role. So when I introduce my, myself and I say, my name is Schlemtnot. I am the granddaughter of the late Stephen and Selena August. You would have an idea not only of who I am and where I'm from, but the work my family did in the community. And every family's work was valued equally. So when we speak of all the levels existing, 
in each building and the non-differentiation from this is social housing, this not. Anyone can look at Raymer or Sam's Landing and know that's social housing. Is that what, I, mean, I don't mean to just put too fine a point on this, but is that what Gregor's house looks like? <laughs> I don't think so. So the discrepancy that's able to exist, that all levels were included and represented in the decisions that were made within the communities that did affect the social structure. We can't talk about social housing without looking at the social architecture that is integral to what that society actually is. Our societies did not value a home as an investment. My home is not an investment. This land is not an investment. This land sustains us, and it's only a matter of time until this land starts pushing back and saying, no, I will not allow this to continue, and we'll be standing right there defending this earth still, defending the homes. Tent City is going to become an even bigger reality because the housing market and, and crisis shows no sign of ending, that the Balmoral has been allowed to get into the state of disrepair that it's in for at least 20 years. I know people who were in there 20 years ago who said, this building is reprehensible, this is disgusting. People who've been in this community for, for their whole lives, who know what reprehensible and disgusting is. So the city passing the buck, especially in the, in the media, Meg's up at City Hall passing the buck and calling the Sahota slumlords. Well, we had a sign that said, Gregor Robertson, Lord of the King of the Slumlords. Is he not in, in all in bed with the developers supporting the developer-driven market? The prioritization, again, and I come back to the same points again and again and again, of lives, of dollars over lives. That, that, that's where we need to shift. So all of, these, all of these realities are what we are dealing with. We need to find real solutions. And I heard a lot of amazing information today that um, I'm going to go home and write something about it. And um, we have... I'm very happy that you finished the way that you did because I always like to have a reason to be hopeful. And not just be hopeful, but have a reason to act. Something good to act on, a good direction to go in. I can't say nuts and nuts and let's go unless we have a good place to go and we have a good reason to gather and not just protecting our most vulnerable, but changing things now, putting a halt to things in the direction that they're going now, certainly protects our future interests as well because what happened to us, the First Nations, is what's happening to everybody. And if people would have stepped up to stop it then, we might not be where we are now. So even in the interest of just protecting our own selves and our own future, and for those who've had kids, looking after the best interests of the babies and grandbabies and the great grandbabies and the eight and 10 generations ahead. We have a duty and a responsibility. And again, um, I can't help but come back to my ancestors. Each person here, this land supports you. My ancestors are in this land. We have a duty and an obligation to follow their ways and their teachings that allowed us to thrive for over 10,000 years, except for the last 200 years, we thrived here since the first sunrise. So um, I thank each person for being here and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say as well. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Am. Thank you, Sama, uh, Melissa, Fiorella, everybody who uh, put this event on. Um, thank you, Audrey, for the uh, tremendously generous welcome. Thank you. And uh, Maloon, thank you for, uh, thanks for coming, man. It's great to have you back and great to spend time with you again. Um, my, name, my name is Matt, and I'm a, uh, I'm a fourth generation settler here on uh, unceded and occupied traditional Coast Salish territory. So uh, thanks to uh, the Coast Salish people for, for having us uh, here on their land. Um, I am uh, going to pull a, 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 a very a neat little rhetorical trick here. Um, especially following three, uh, three of my very favorite speakers and totally powerful people. I, I don't actually have anything to say here, um, but what I'm gonna do is I've got three separate sets of questions that I wanna ask Maloon, and maybe we can go from there. Um, I warned him it was coming. Um, uh, so my, my first question, and they're, they're somewhat entangled. Um, my first question is a question of rights. Um, I've, I've long admired uh, Maloon's approach, and uh, in particular his, well, his experience, his wide experience in his, uh, uh, kind of critical and affirmative vision. Um, but I'm, I have to say that I've been long very skeptical of a rights-based approach. Um, it strikes me that the notion of rights m is inherently legalistic. And at its heart, it means I'm going to beat you in court. And so then 
a rights-based approach tends to defer to particular kinds of Westphalian logics, and in my experience, seems to blunt social movements in such a way that it reduces many of our efforts to lobbying uh, levels of government. And I'm hoping you can speak to the way that you have deployed rights and, can, and, and shift my thinking a little bit on that, if you could. Um, so that's the first question. Um, a second question um, is around the idea of municipal level of action. Uh, one of the things that I think that I've long held um, as a particular kind of political rationality is that the political energy for solving and thinking about housing, but um, uh, among many other kinds of uh, critical issues, has to reside at the municipal level. Um, but one of the things that, that is so endemic, and I hear many people speak of it, including this panel tonight, is the constant passing of the buck by municipal officials. Mm -hmm. And the, the language that has been deployed for as long as I can remember here is constantly deferring to the notion that, well, we can't do anything at the municipal level unless federal government comes on board. And, it, and it's a particular kind of gift of, I like to think of it as maybe just a Vancouver anomaly, but I know it's not, having spent a lot of time in places like Seattle and Portland to meet with elected officials who are able to speak incredibly eloquently, apparently empathetically, and are able to tell you all the right words as if they are actually on your side and are actually able to articulate a particular kind of progressive housing policy and then can turn around and do absolutely nothing. Um, in Portland, they call it death by listening. Um, and it's got a particular kind of resonance here with uh, city councilors, many of whom uh, I have known and, and, and interacted with for a long time, and many of whom I, I like personally, but are able to say all the right words and are be able to echo all kinds of languages that sound uh, incredibly hopeful, and then absolutely nothing changes at all. Um, and that even when Gregor's response to Maloon today was, oh, absolutely, we're, we're, we're horrified at the Balmoral and we just hope that the federal, uh, you know, the federal government gets on board with housing. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular kind of strategy that is, I, I think is has been incredibly effective in the city for a long time. Um, and, and it's also incredibly infuriating um, in all kinds of ways. And I suspect many of you have encountered this in similar ways. And so my second question is, Maloon, what the hell do you do about that? How do you like, think that through? Like, how do you approach that? Um, because in many cities, like I say, that I've been worked in, working in an encounter, it's, a, it's an incredibly effective strategy for, for, blunting, uh, for blunting demands, in this case, around housing. Um, and my third question um, for you as well. We can go in yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my, my, my third question here for you is, and you, you spoke about it, and a couple of folks have talked about it, is uh, this, this endemic fetishization of home ownership. Um, and I, I noted that so often this, the debate in this city ends up with something like, well, I won't be able to afford to buy a home here. Um, and I find, that, I find it really problematic in all kinds of ways, not the least of which that home ownership has proven itself uh, an incredibly resilient tool for exacerbating inequality. Um, if you follow the, the trajectory of home ownership discourses in this, in, in this part of the world, but in the United States uh, specifically, home ownership is perhaps the single greatest tool for creating inequality. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw that Matt Desmond article in, uh, in the New York Times, maybe three, New York Times Magazine, maybe three weeks ago, maybe. And, and one of the really interesting claims he made there was that the Obama administration had somewhere priced out ending homelessness in the United States at something around a billion dollars a year for 10 years consecutively. Um, which off the top sounds like maybe some money, but actually is less than 1% of the mid-level home ownership deduction. Um, that is offered annually in the United States. So the idea that somehow uh, that a that that ending homelessness that even at a, at a at an immense scale is beyond us is is just absurd. Um, it's absolutely untrue and, and at every level. But I suspect that a lot of that actually has to do with dislodging and dislocating the fetishization with home ownership, which seems to have uh, gripped middle class imaginaria, uh, in not in only in this part of the world, but in across North America. And, I, and it's one of the reasons I, I appreciate much of what you were talking about today again. Um, but also not just in a, in a policy sense, but in a philosophical sense that I, I, I 
could, could scarcely more strenuously object to the notion of turning land into property and commodifying every single last uh, inch and cranny of our lives and then presuming that that commodity is something that can and should be marketized and speculated on. And so I'm most interested in how you think that we can dislodge, not only just at a policy and a political level, but at a, at a philosophical and a social level, how can we dislodge this fetishization of home ownership? Because the things that home ownership ostensibly provide, security of tenure, independence, et cetera, can be achieved much more effectively through a whole number of other mechanisms. And I'm hoping you can speak to that as well. So those are my three questions, and I'm hoping you can, you can answer all of them in the next like three or four minutes, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, I'm going to try that trick next time I have to be on a panel and not, 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 <laughs> not prepare comments but have questions. Um, and, and the third question you answered yourself, so I'm, I'm not going to get into that. You did. Yeah. You, you've written about it. I mean, I, I'm sure you can. Um, on the first, uh, the first question, I think um, the approach on human rights uh, that you are sort of understanding or imbibing is a very narrow approach. Uh, human rights are, you know, historically and even currently around the world, the way they're being practiced, uh, they're essentially stressing the moral and the ethical more than the legal. They're stressing the notion that the dignity of an individual or the collective identity of a community um, is what has to be uh, preserved and, and, you know, strengthened. Uh, so all over the world, if you see um, uh, social movements, if you see even, you know, I, as I was giving the example of Barcelona, um, uh, rights have been used as a very, very powerful tool for mobilization, for, for getting people to move away from the notion of basic needs or humanitarian need, to say that it's, it's their rights, it's my claim to uh, what rightfully belongs to me, and that's not just a legal notion, and I can give you, you know, dozens of examples where social movements on the right to food, on the right to information, on a range of issues have mobilized around the notion of rights, and and obviously, you know, it gives them a, a Philip, if if the uh, if that mobilization articulation uh, is backed up by law or by international instruments or by the United Nations, for example. Uh, so I, th I think that uh, you, it, it has to move away from the just seeing it as a legal and, and uh, I mean, I hear this, I heard this a lot in the United States when I was teaching there also that it's just about going to court. But, but in a sense, uh, where my experience is working on the ground in many different countries, going to the court is the last resort, right? You can do a lot without having to go to court. And I think that should be that should be the policy. You can do it through mobilization, you can do it through resistance, you know, sitting in the office of the mayor. I mean you can do it through so many different ways, but around around the notion of rights. And I think that's that's what people find powerful. And I've seen, you know, people who are homeless, people who are living in very difficult conditions who are energized by that idea that, you know, it's not no, someone is not going to come to them and give them a home, but that's something they have to fight for, something they have to struggle for. And again, that's built around the notion of rights. Um, the second question on, on the municipal level of action, some of the examples that I was giving, um, and I think that's a really critical piece of municipal action, is that there has to be a very rigorous, very active, very well thought out participation from the community. I mean, we cannot have a system where a local government or governments at any level make decisions on what affects our lives without talking to us, right? And, and I think that has to be built into, uh, so, so, you know, if we say that local authorities have a very s significant responsibility, and right now around the world, actually, uh, much of the progressive work is being done by local authorities. That it's, it's bypassing national governments, because that's where people are, that's where things happen. Uh, and I don't buy this argument of the mayor here or anywhere that, that well, no, we blame the federal government. I, I think there's significant power within cities, uh, particularly if it's an alliance, kind of. So it's not just the elected officials, but it's also all of you, you know. Uh, if there is that alliance, there's, a, there's nothing that cannot be done, right? Um, and so, so I think the municipal uh, the, the, the participation, the consultation. I mean, we have, you know, many cities in the world where people have said to the 
mayor or the elected officials, well, you don't have a solution, but here's a solution. I have an alternative to how my slum or my informal settlement can be improved, right? So that's, that's a very direct kind of, and then it's a responsibility of the elected officials to make it happen uh, with the people. So, so uh, the, the issue of, of participation of consent, in many parts of the world you have situations where you, you know, a government just cannot come in and say, okay, we're going to have this uh, development project and you have to leave. There has to be a consultation, there has to be an agreement uh, with the people. Um, so I, I think those are the issues that have to be um, that have to be looked at. Um, obsession of home ownership, I'm hoping that someone, some people in the audience and the other panelists can come into that, and if there's time, I'll, I'll say a few words. Yeah, before I, Two I out of three, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> before I go out to uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience, I'm gonna throw one out to uh, all of you on the panel here, which is Melanie. Uh, Mark was here from the provincial government. Maloon is meeting with city staff tomorrow for a a conversation uh, around policy, but if any of you had some specific ideas of what you'd like a federal, provincial, or civic government to be doing right now, if there's one or two things at any level of government that you wanted to throw out as something they could be doing right now to uh, enhance affordability or to change the facts on the ground that we have uh, right now. <laughs> so for the provincial government, we need welfare rates at 1,500 a month. We need rent control based on the unit, not the tenant. And we need uh, 10,000 units of social housing a year. <laughs> that would do it. That would end homelessness. And for the, for the feds, we need, we need them to share with that 10,000 units of social housing a year, which means they need to put major bucks into social housing. I think those are the three big things. Welfare, rent control, and social housing. There's a huge problem with that question <laughs> because in 2014, the city changed the definition of social housing. So they're saying now that they're building thousands and thousands of units of social housing, but low-income people like on welfare or pension who can only afford 375 or 400 a month can only afford maybe six to eight percent of what the city is calling social housing. We'll take questions at the end because we've got to get a... Get so, so. so the, the question, because they've changed this definition, it's just screwed everything up. People think that they're building tons of social housing and nothing is happening for low-income people. A lot of the so-called social housing that they're building is renting for like 1500 1800 for a bachelor. So it adds to that list, um, just a couple of things, pointing to the federal government in particular and its tax structure. So capital gains tax needs to be fixed because that's the way in which people are reaping unearned, unfair, huge amounts of money tax-free. And there are also our, uh, there are federal subsidies for home ownership of a number of other sources as well, and we don't have the adequate subsidies for purpose-built rental housing. So, th so there are lots of social policy tools available at the federal level through its tax system and uh, through its spending power that can come into play as well. And, and I think the piece you mentioned that's also really important, it ties into the third, I'll just say, unanswered question, Maloon, about home ownership <coughs> is, um, the Residential Tenancy Act has a lot to do with making rental accommodation as good as uh, home ownership. So the things like security of tenure or control that makes people want to own their homes are achievable through a progressive residential tenancy law as well. And so the details about rent control, about um, making sure there's security of tenure for renters are really important if we want to move away from a North American fixation on home ownership being sort of a natural event in the course of one's lifetime. One little thing it's thought about home ownership is um, I think a lot of people think of home ownership as being their ticket to old age security or security in old age. So if there was actually 
uh, public programs that provided um, security in old age, like maybe an increase in the guaranteed income supplement or something, that might help. Yes. I only have two things to add. The, live, the living minimum wage, which, um, you know, the Shama Swant, Swant in Seattle, was, they say it should be fifteen dollars, but from Van, but for Vancouver, and this was two years ago, it would have to be just over twenty dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, the decentralization of power that affects housing, income, pension, uh, people's ability to just live their lives. The centralization of power creates monopolies that exacerbate the inequality that that then makes this huge chasm between the the between the wealthy and the poor so not contributing to that anymore and actively working to create the opposite of that which is not necessarily a socialist um, way of living but an inclusive way of living that considers all in society I just wanted to jump in on the question of uh, the potential for cities to deal with this issue. And I guess I sort of disagree with you, but I agree with you also. So I think it is true that in a federal state like Canada, where we have power or jurisdiction to do laws divided between the federal and provincial governments, governments do tend to do a sort of shell game, which is when you lift their cup, the ball's never under it. It's on the, under the other level of government's cup. And so we see that happen between federal and provincial governments in the city as well as a, a form of government that's derivative from the provincial government. But I also think at the same time, cities do have considerably more limited jurisdiction in, in Canada in particular. That's not true of all cities around the world. They have uh, limited access to resources compared to the federal and provincial governments. And there are some things cities simply can't do legally. So for example, the vacancy, the, the empty homes tax, they had to get special permission, a change to the Vancouver Charter to implement that. So in terms of revenue generation, in terms of social policy, cities can't do it on their own. They can't fix the welfare rate, for example. They can't deal with the uh, much of the income inequality. They can't deal with a minimum wage outside of their own employees. And so the city is right in saying that it needs to have the federal and provincial governments on hand, which is not, however, to say that they're off the hook for not doing as much as they can do. But it is to say, in Canada particularly, our cities have much more limited uh, policy and resource room than the other levels of government do. No, you're right, uh, Margo, absolutely. Um, so when I was here on Mission 2007, I really noticed that, that there was this constant blame game. But the point I was trying to make is that in spite of all those limitations, the city can do a lot more than what they've been doing, right? So the Balmoral thing doesn't have to happen. Uh, the kind of homelessness you have doesn't have. So, so the, the point is that they cannot, you know, make an excuse of not acting by blaming another form of government and without first having tried out everything that is in their power to do. And I think that's what we have to hold them accountable for, right? So. I think we're going to open it up to uh, questions. There'll be a couple of microphones uh, coming out. If you could just uh, state your name and ask a question or a, or a comment, they'll be coming to you shortly. If any questions that people have or comments, great. Got someone right there. So got somebody right there in the middle. Thank you very much, everybody, for your input. Um, <laughs> just because it's immediately on my, on my mind, I remember hearing in the Canadian national, provincial, and, and municipal structures um, that the way historically our cities have developed, um, that Toronto has the same amount of municipal power as, let's say, Nelson, BC. Mm -hmm. That th there's, and, and so that's where comparing, let's say, San Francisco to Toronto or Vancouver is a little bit of an unfair comparison. So given that kind of disparity between, let's say, um, the Canadian context and the American cont context, how can we, that's question number four, perhaps, how do we resolve that um, 
equation between municipal, provincial, and federal, and, and perhaps empower the city more? Is that possible legally? Or, uh, so, question open there, right. anybody. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we'll take two or three questions in a row. We had one over there, another one over here. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for all of your words. Um, consistently when I've been to lectures like this or presentations, the end uh, comes to, well, we need to get policy change in place and there needs to be new rules. And then that happens because we have the political will to do so. But clearly we haven't gained the political will. And so what I am wondering is that like my parents, for example, are probably upper middle class family. And I know that my parents probably wouldn't be very happy about increased taxation, which could subsidize all these different things. So how do we transform the message somehow to appeal to this massive segment of the population, which is what policymakers are making their decisions based on, is that they know that they will stay in power because a massive segment of the population will continue to vote for them. Thank you. I'll take that one more question before I answer right there. Hi, uh, my name is Laurie Thompson. Thank you so much for tonight. Um, I work in the philanthropic sector, and sometimes I have people just say to me, but like, how do we live, how does this happen in our city? I don't understand, like, is, is it not something that money can be thrown at? Like, why do we have to wait for governments to help us? Why can't we just do something about this kind of thing? And I'm not suggesting that I have the money to throw at it or the resources to do that, but there is some element of there's, a lot of money left on the table when it comes to a lot of things where I think if we handed people something on a platter to say this would end homelessness, I bet a lot of people would step up. But is that even a realistic solution? Can you do it outside of government? Is it a short-term solution to do it outside of government? Great, thank you. Wondering if you guys could respond to any of this. Maybe we can start with Maloon and then go to others. Okay, um, I don't know, I've been struggling with that. How do you transform the message? How, we, we were talking about that llama the other day. How do you get people who aren't rich to care about hom homelessness and poverty? The, the only, the one line that I keep thinking, which is uh, all the studies have shown, is it's cheaper to end homelessness than maintain it. <laughs> that should appeal to taxpayers. Um, that plus the fact that homeless people have half the life expectancy of other people, you'd think if they have some kind of concern around that kind of thing, it would work. So those are the two facts that I'm always using. But as you can tell, I haven't worked very well at this point. Then um, the charity question. I don't think there's enough money in charity to do everything that we need. And the other thing that happens is... Um, you get, I, I really don't want housing to become like food where people have to line up for, at food banks in order to get, get what they need. And we have an example of a new, build, a new housing building that's at welfare rate actually for uh, single parents and their kids that's on top of the new Strathcona Library. Um, that CAP, Carnegie Action Project, fought tooth and nail for that. Um, but it's funded by charitable m money, and do you know what the name of the housing part of it is? Because We Care House. So how would you like having, if you were a kid, how would you like living in that? Being stigmatized as a charity case among all your friends. Oh, I live at Because We Care House because people donated and I'm a charity case. It's awful, right? So... Plus, I remember one time back in the 80s doing a study about the impact of the cuts in unemployment insurance. And there was a study that came out and said it was, I don't know, it was, it was enormous. And at that time, they were having all these uh, charitable fundraisers uh, called the Taste of the Nation where people would dress up in formal clothes and drive up in limousines and go and eat gourmet food and donate money to give by trucks for food banks so that they could take leftover food from events like that to poor people. And um, 
I remember doing the calculations. I can't remember exactly what it was. It's in my book. But it was something like you'd have to have an event like that every, you'd have to have like 20 events like that every day for a year in order to make up for, for what had been cut out of unemployment insurance. So there's like no conceivable way that you can make up for social program cuts by charity. It's just impossible. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, this issue of um, you know what you were expressing about uh, being frustrated by these kinds of events in panels, um, I think it brings us back to this question of we also have to ask ourselves if we are doing enough. Uh, you know, some of the city examples that I was giving, uh, people didn't really wait for the government to respond um, or the authorities to respond, uh, but essentially took it upon themselves not not by themselves or by philanthropic organizations to provide housing, but to mobilize around that, to have campaigns, to have movements, to have much more uh, sort of consistent media work, to expose, you know, someone was saying, so why do people, cities get away with it? Well, we have to expose what they're getting away with. Is there enough information out there to say that these are all the human rights violations that are happening in the city? You know, this, this is the, th these are the numbers of people who are suffering uh, and, and to hold them accountable. And I think that ultimately, you know, people get elected to serve all of us, right? So we cannot let them off the hook and, and somebody else solves the problem. But definitely we have a role to, to expose them, to shame them, to offer alternatives, to have more alliances across sectors. And it's not my place to, you know, suggest that here in Vancouver, but I think it would be a good question to ask is, is enough being done? Is there enough support for what Gene is doing, or is there, you know, is there enough um, of a collective effort uh, to change the situation? Yes, yeah. Well, I think I'm going to uh, uh, answer a question that wasn't asked, but uh, you often hear, maybe maybe obliquely, I, I hear resonating through some of the questions as, a, as, a, as an issue of like scale. Who, I mean, if, if this is this above or beyond? everyday activity that we're, that, you know, that it's, it's, it's the, the scale of the problem that has to be solved at some kind of upper level of, of, of government that, that, um, that precludes everyday kind of organizing in a real way. And I, among the, the many possible responses I think might be one is that um, I'm convinced that we are never going to be able to uh, escape the velocity of a predatory land market when we are still living uh, uh, in a in a regime of colonial brutality. Um, that this is very recently and continually stolen indigenous land, and that I don't think until we uh, uh, levels of government sincerely uh, and legitimately uh, address indigenous land rematriation, are we ever going to be able to think about land in a legitimate and ethical way. Um, Leanne Simpson says this thing that's, that, I, that I repeat because it's, it's super smart, but she says, uh, and she's, she sat right here and said, and she says, you know, under Canadian law, even if, if you steal a car from somebody, you still have to give it back. If you get caught, even if you really like that car, even if it's really useful to you, even if it's been in your family for generations, if you get caught stealing a car, you still got to give it back. And... I cannot see that we are going to fundamentally change the nature of this land market uh, until w w land is no longer a market. And I think the first step on that is, is has to be and is actually the root of the rationalities that are gripping not just the city but individuals and in a collective sense uh, is the, the everyday reality of, of living on stolen land. And, and that actually, I think, is something that can be addressed in a very real and everyday sense. Um, and I think the, the best story that I've heard and the most kind of hopeful story I've heard is, of, and I wish I could remember his name, but the, the farmer in uh, Sukhothin territory who uh, earlier this year uh, gave back his farm because he recognized that it was on stolen land. Uh, and I don't know the details, and I should more, except to say that it was that simple as far as I understood it. He recognized he was on stolen land, and he gave it back. Um, and so I would actually call on homeowners um, to do the same here. Thank you. 
Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that so I don't have to. Um, um, it's a huge point that I see from I see from, from a standpoint that is entirely different from most people that I hear people talk about, yes, but this is my property and I have a deed and we signed a piece of paper, but at, underneath it all, it's still stolen, it's still occupied, it's not your land, it's my ancestors' land. We've cared for it for over 10,000 years and because someone signed a piece of paper on a building that was illegally put on stolen occupied land that empowered a patriarchal, colonial, genocidal, misogynistic system, my matriarchal system of laws and survival and thriving has been all but obliterated and now that piece of paper has more power than 10,000 years of history. This is the bottom line for me. I hear people talk about how they'll never be able to own a home in Vancouver. I know, I know what that feels like. Now add the fact that your ancestors are in this land and that it's your job to care for them. So when you ask, how do we, how do we approach your parents? How do we get that message across to them? The one thing that I come down to time and time again is we sit in a room and we connect as human beings. We're not the other anymore. I'm not a First Nations woman, you're not a white man, we're human beings first and we sit and we come from places of similarity while still honor and res honoring and respecting those differences. We're not gonna accomplish anything by hacking each other at the knee. Again and again I come to the same point and this is where I come from, love and inclusion. I don't have to like you to love you and I don't have to like you to include you in, in my thoughts and in my processes of creating a better society which is what I work at doing every day. So when we leave here, what are you going to do to move towards those ends yourself? So that, that's, that's hard to follow um, for a law professor who's about to talk <laughs> about... <laughs> um, not all land. Some land is owned by the Crown. Underlying title in the Canadian legal system is to the Crown, but land that has been transferred to individuals in the Canadian legal system is not crown land anymore. Um, I was going to add, just jump in in a, in a sort of dry way, um, which is what I've learned to do in the law school, uh, to say a couple of things, which is, um, Matt, I share um, an ambivalence about rights because I, I see the way in which they're co-opting into a system that's actually uh, reductive and individualistic. But I also think about how rights can be gestures of empowerment and granting of dignity. And the other thing that I like about the rights language is that it uh, involves the assumption that the collective, in my mind that's the state and the government, has a responsibility to ensure that that right is met. And so it's not, that the notion of charity doesn't work if you frame housing as a right because it's an entitlement that there's an obligation for the government to provide with predictability and adequacy and regularity which charity can't guarantee and moreover it's a marker of your sort of personhood and dignity that you get this without question and that it's not a commodity in the market as well. Things that we grant a right status to ought not to be traded in the market as goods and as investment devices and so on. So I think there's a lot of power in the notion of the right to housing, but I think there's a danger to see it reductively only as that and, and the collective aspect of our shared existence gets lost in rights talk. And I do think that rights have as sort of their underlying power, the notion of the fact that you, people will be held accountable and the courts are our dominant accountability mechanism. And once you get into the courts asserting something, there's a way in which you, victory is always constrained and limited and sometimes completely co-opting and unpredictably bad in that way. But I think rights are a powerful way to, to deal with the question of entitlement versus charity. And, and David, your question about could we give our cities more power? Well, the power we give our cities would come from the provincial government and not, I mean, cities have different kinds of responsibilities. Toronto has delegated authority for welfare systems and delivery in a way that British Columbia, the cities in British Columbia don't. The Vancouver Charter gives Vancouver slightly more powers than it does other cities who have a different statutory basis. So it is a device of law um, and the provinces do delegate in different kinds of packages to different cities, but we're stuck with um, a federal system nonetheless and some things remaining uh, unavoidably at the federal level. 
Just a one small point I <clears throat> wanted to make as well is that you know a lot of people have argued that the um, the kind of housing policy at the civic provincial federal government is in a kind of state of regulatory capture, and some of that is driven by the economics. You know, when we live in a city where there aren't election spending limits at the civic level, where you can actually donate a billion dollars if you wanted to in in the system, and given the amped up uh, economies of the sector, without that being reined in and having some sort of mature framework around that, uh, it's going to be very difficult to even get moderate policy change because of the way uh, the rules of the game are, are stacked uh, related to the funding of political parties. I just wanted to raise this issue of, um, I think all over the world I, I see that there isn't enough um, reflection on the harm that the commodification of land, property, and housing does. Um, that it obviously, from an you know, indigenous Aboriginal perspective, it, it completely removes the notion of the sacredness of land or the spirituality of the affinity uh, to the land. But for you know, those of us who are not uh, from, from, who are non-indigenous, I think the, the great harm that commodification does is that it promotes greed and avarice and corruption and so it, it, in a way, sort of destroys the social uh, ethos and the social human being uh, from within. And so, you know, you hear all the time conversations about how much money did somebody make and what is the level of speculation and how much am I going to get if I hold this property for another year, two years. Uh, so I think that, I think there needs to be more writing, more reflection, more perhaps even cultural and, you know, sort of media work and and films and so on to, to, to actually really get it out there to everybody that what are we doing to ourselves as a society, what are we doing to ourselves as, as, as people, as individuals, as communities by this sort of incredible obsession with, with commodification and buying and selling. And I, I really think we need to reflect on that much more. So the commodification, the commodification of what is sacred, as in humans, homes, water, sacred rock, standing rock, anybody. Um, the commodification of what is sacred is what leads to murder to missing women that continues through to today, even while the inquiry is still happening. Uh, we've got time for about three more questions, but we do have the room until 9.30, so please feel free to stick around for questions. I've got a question right there, Judy, Judy Graves. Thank you. Um, in the city of Vancouver, about 2% of the population is First Nations. In the streets of Vancouver, about 30%, maybe a little more than 30% of the absolute homeless, this is people not in shelters, this is people sleeping in the streets, are First Nations. Of the people who are First Nations, who are sleeping in the streets, who are women. The majority of the women who are sleeping in the streets, by far, are First Nations. When I go into the Balmoral Hotel and I walk through and I greet all of the tenants, the vast majority of the people who are living in the Balmoral Hotel are First Nations. And it doesn't seem like such awful housing to them because if they go home to reserve, the housing is worse. So I can see and I can understand in the big picture and the long-term picture that the solution to this is just resolution of land claims. But I'm 68. And I've been working on this stuff still. I was in my 20s. There are not very many people who are First Nations in the city of Vancouver who are as old as I am because they die in their 40s. I am not willing to play with this forever. What is the fastest route to making a difference in this while well, I'm still alive? Thank you, Judy. We're, we're going to take two more questions and oh, then yes, we can come yes. back. Yeah, just got time for two more questions and we're going to come back for the answers. Put one there. Go ahead. 
Is this on? This is on. Okay, I'm tripping over some details. Um, like how to create availability of housing without having much vacancy. Also, um, how to perform repairs that are needed for, without displacing tenants. And um, um, how do costs of erecting buildings play into rent and such? Thank you. We got time for one last question right there. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a, a few points uh, I'd just like to offer for consideration. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I think human rights are something that we're all, we've all been endowed with at birth. Um, it's something that is inherent to us all when we're born. They're not something that governments grant us mm -hmm. because if they're granted to us, then they can be taken away. So that's you know, one point. Um, also, uh, I think that uh, you know, governments, like any other large institution, are largely uh, self-serving. And a lot of these issues uh, are not uh, in, in their interest. And the more that we look to government to try and solve the problem, which is a lot of the problem has been caused by government, we're, we're maybe not uh, putting our energies in, in the right direction. And I think that uh, the more that we look to government to solve problems, we're, we're shifting our own um, sort of power and responsibilities to government and looking for them to solve problems. So most people think, well, why do I need to do anything? Because, you know, government you know, will take care of it. So I think that if we turn the focus more on society itself and all of us in communities to take it upon ourselves to take action to solve these problems, we have the money. Because where does government get their money from? They get it all from us through taxation. So, yes, charity can and philanthropy can solve the problem because ultimately the funds come from all of us. So I just... just I'd like to make. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Did uh, any of you want to respond to any of those, uh, including Judy's uh, first uh, comment? I would, I would really like to respond to Judy's and also um, for anyone else who, who um, has something to add to it. I'm going to tie together the last question and also what the, the amazingly true and devastating facts about the First Nations under, over, and non-representation on what is still, I'm gonna say it again and again, our unceded land. The fact that in the, um, that natives are excluded from the Canadian Bill of Rights, which Sir John A. MacDonald uh, put together around the time of the Indian Act, is a huge reason why those stats that you said are true. And to me, those aren't just statistics. This is what has actually happened to my people. I've had family die on these streets. My mom died of a fentanyl overdose. I grew up, everything you've heard about First Nations, that's my life. Why am I not on these streets? Why am I not in the murdered and missing women's numbers or highway of tears? Um, how do we move forward? Healing. It's really, it's, it's deceptively simple. We are each responsible for our own healing, despite whatever has happened to us. And I say this coming from a place of being, you know, three and four generations residential school. And on my father's side, my father's, my father's father was born in India, a little half breed who was sent to military school at five years old. I know that what happened in residential schools didn't just happen to brown people; it's happened around the world to to all colors. We do not. We do not own the suffering only of what happens at the hands of a lot of the evildoers out there, and I don't know another phrase for them. Um, the only reason I'm able to sit here and share my experiences um, is because I was granted the opportunity to heal because I had the benefit of, of connecting to my culture, connecting to my people. It wasn't even five years ago that I was still ashamed of being an Indian. I was happy for people to mistake me for being Filipino or anything else. And then under the bridge protecting my ancestors, all of a sudden I started to feel pride in who I am. But I also had the benefit of education and a father who loved me and um, um, 
who would never walk away and never give up on me. That's not, that is not what most of the people in my family and my community have had. So we have this endemic system of colonization in our communities through the electoral system of chief and council, which is not how we worked before. Aquilinis would not be in my community before. <laughs> I can tell you that much. So finding our own ways to heal. Um, for me, I found my healing started in a, in a women's Tibetan Buddhist temple in Strathcona. When we each take the responsibility to heal ourselves, and when we recognize that the person standing in front of you isn't just suffering but working to thrive, I won't look at a person and feel sorry for them anymore. I will look at a person and, and I won't even feel hopeful. I will look at a person and know that they are capable of healing if we find the right ways. And that means connecting. That means knocking down the walls and building bridges, not allowing the same as the question about how do we reach the, the people who don't want the, the, the higher taxes. We have to humanize. We have to rehumanize. We have to heal. We have to hold each other accountable. It comes down to the same basic principles that have been completely obliterated. We have to rehumanize, we have to reconnect, and we have to heal ourselves. And we rebuild our society based on what we want and, and what we need. And that means things like the Indian Act and the Canadian Bill of Rights, excuse my language, but don't have, but don't, don't mean shit. It has power because you put power in it. Put your power somewhere else. So when we empower people, like I worked my whole life to empower my mom and it still didn't save her, but it saved me, and now I'm here carrying on the work of those ancestors. And when you say, where, where is your generation? That was the hardest hit generation from what I can see. My mom's generation is the most wiped out generation in my community and in all the communities that I work with. So recognizing the truth of these things, and I'm not looking, I'm not interested in pointing in fingers and saying it's the government's fault, it's this person's fault. This is the truth of how we got here. This is, this is how we're gonna get out of it. And anyone who wants to come and stand with me and work with me with, only good intentions in their heart and mind. Come on, let's stand together and let's do this. I'm not, have I I thought you wanted to say something, sorry. Oh no, it's okay. I, I was, um, so Judy, I think your question is a really important question and it's a really tough question to answer. And, and thank you for really a very powerful answer to it. And I'm hoping this is supplementary to that because I do think there's also a collective responsibility for um, the Canadian state towards Indigenous people and that there has to be a real redistribution of resources um, for, for all kinds of just outcomes, but pointedly in this context for Indigenous people. So I'm just thinking of, you know, the human rights case under the Canadian Human Rights Act and the federal government's seemingly inexplicable refusal to pay the money into the Indigenous child welfare system. That's just an example of how we need government spending. And so um, when I think about the potable water issue on reserves, I think it's a question of redistribution of resources. And so I think I, I would say, as a non-Indigenous person, from my perspective, it's we need a realignment of resource allocation and priorities. How do we do that now? I think we vote in different governments. I don't know. I'll, I'll be. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's certainly true that the parties we've had who've been in government at the federal level haven't delivered, for sure. And and maybe this is connects to your comment, Maloon, about the need for a really active civil society, and that we ask the parties that who want our support, what our support is conditional, or we tell them what it's conditional upon. But I do think that this is ultimately a question of political will. Um, and and uh, short of imagining a totally radically different system, we need governments that do different things. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna pass to other people on the panel. Yeah. I'll maybe ask uh, Maloon to close though, uh, because this was the last set of questions. Um, well, I, I think that, um, thanks very much for all the questions and uh, this amazing panel. Um, I, I think uh, there's a sort of duality here which we have to unite and I think it's a you know the solutions are there um, we have to come up with the solutions uh, but we, at the same time we cannot let the government off the hook right they, they have a reach that none of us individually have or as institutions um, so the question is how do we are we proposing the solutions I mean it, what is can we come up with a solution to the Balmoral 
I don't know, has it been tried? Can, can somebody say, okay, this is how this uh, hotel or this saro is going to be, uh, needs to be fixed and this is how it has to be done. And that solution then has to be rammed down the throat of whatever government is there. Uh, so so it, it's not waiting for something to happen, but it's us. And I've seen that all over the world. I've seen it with the, with the poorest people in the slums, you know, sitting down with a chalk on a, on a piece of land and saying, okay, this is, my, this is a demarcation. This is where my house is. This is how it has to be upgraded. So if they can do it, why can't we? I mean, why can we not come up with a solution? So that, that would be the main message. Thank you very much.